right. We are not able to get started unless someone volunteers to be a note taker. Who wants to be a note taker? Okay, we would like to start, but we still do need to meet uh, a note taker. Now, no one wants to be a note taker, but we need someone to be a note taker. Can I? <laughs> okay, what's going on? Okay, this works. Okay. Welcome all. We're about to start M D. And now that we have a few other folks in, looks like we have some prospective note takers who have walked in. Who would like to be the note taker? We will begin coercion. <laughs> oh, okay. fantastic. Great. Yeah. All right. Please. That's all we and, ask and for. You don't just try. Yeah. Be, don't be afraid to shout at people too. Get their names and everything. The rest don't do. Let me try. Um, yeah, just email to us when you're done. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. Uh, so, welcome to the Embo and D portion of today's meeting. Pim will be following us. Water. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, let's start with, as we do always, the note well. Uh, please note the new note well. Um, okay, noted. Uh, agenda. Um, We'll start with a few working group uh, items. Um, Mike will be speaking about his uh, data center deployment draft, giving an update on that. Um, Tim will be talking about the deprecate ASM for interdomain inter -domain deployments draft. Uh, we have a very special um, uh, presentation on uh, from William Zhang. Um, he is a high school student uh, from Thomas Jefferson High School. Um, and he's for his senior project, he's been uh, deploying and operating an AMT, a public AMT relay uh, on that's connected to I2 and the commodity internet. And he's going to talk about his experiences so far. Um, not sure if we've ever had a high school student speak at IETF. Um, so this might be a first, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, and then Sandy will talk, uh, give an update on the Yang models and um, uh, Mike and Charlie will talk about the recently adopted uh, Wi-Fi draft. Um, anything to add? Any complaints? Anyone want to bash the agenda? Okay. Moving along. Um, 
Status of the active working group drafts. Uh, so first, uh, the Internobian peering draft uh, has been around, had been around for a long time, and since the last IETF, it has finally uh, become an RFC. So congratulations to Percy and team. Uh, Eighty-three thirteen. Um, currently, uh, in last call, uh, at, or currently at IESG, is the M Trace draft. Uh, while it's been there, it has uh, there's been a number of uh, good, helpful comments um, and discuss issues. Uh, recently, there was some pretty substantive security issues brought up, um, and uh, these the uh, authors late last week provided some updates to the draft uh, in response to those discuss items. Um, do we have either any of the uh, Hitoshi or Kerry in the room? No. Um, so their comments uh, somewhat speak for themselves last week. Uh, hopefully this should be enough to clear up the uh, discuss issues. Um, and hopefully we can uh, move that along. Uh, the since last IETF, the uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, problems draft was was adopted by the working group, um, and I believe it was merged with another draft. Mike and Charlie are going to provide updates on that. Um, and there's the uh, data center deployment draft. Mike's going to talk about that today. Uh, other drafts uh, that have not yet been um, adopted. Um, is the uh, Yang models draft. Sandy will give us an update, uh, but essentially he took that since last uh, meeting, he took that to um, uh, the Yang doctors and uh, the Yang doctors did um, uh, give some comments and helpful feedback uh, and he has updated the draft. Um, or I'm sorry, she. Uh, she. Um, and the uh, the multi the uh, models draft was uh, went to um, uh, went for adoption call didn't quite get enough support for um, uh, for adoption. Uh, however, there was some a little bit of confusion as to what it was saying. Uh, it's been trimmed down um, to just focus on the deprecation of a uh, of ASM, uh, less so on uh, mo in, uh, models. And Tim's going to provide an update on that and uh, possibly see if we're ready for adoption after that. Okay, so I noticed uh, William uh, has joined. Um, Mike, if you don't mind, William has a bus to catch for school, um, literally. Uh, so, um, William, are you ready to present? He is. He's on the meet echo. Um, Okay. All right. Okay, Tim, why don't you come up then? Mike, you're getting bumped by two people. Sorry. Mm -hmm. But you, you got to stay here the whole time, so. Um. Yes, and they're standing in the red box. Pink, box. pink? Pink box. Right, okay, so it says on, but it's, it's in the on position. I know the red light's come on. Turn it off and on. <coughs> but it's still. Right. Can you hear me? Oh, of course, it's remote people. Yeah, I'll, I'll ping you. <laughs> And yes, sir. Uh, rock and roll. <laughs> God, that's heavy. It's much heavier than it looks, this. Okay, so talking about, um, as the chair said, we ha had originally a, a draft, the multicast models draft, and we've now um, adjusted that into a new focus. So what I'm going to talk about now is um, deprecating ASM for interdomain multicast. Uh, we've got three authors there from the previous version, and Torlis is also potentially coming on board as an author, but unfortunately he can't be here because he's over-chairing Anima at the moment. So next slide. 
So yeah, the original draft was about multicast service models, and it was quite long and had lots of sort of messages in it. And the feedback we've got from the past two ITF meetings is basically to focus on one of the key messages, which is about promoting the use of SSM and deprecating uh, complementary deprecation of ASM into domain. So we've posted a new draft as a zero zero um, covering that topic. Next slide. Um, so a reminder of one of the, the early drivers for this, or one of the drivers for this work, there's obviously a, a, lot, of others, a lot of others out there. Um, but there was a proposal made by David Farmer on the Internet 2 list, which sort of captures the, the thrust of what operators are, are saying, which is that um, running interdomain ASM is a non-trivial task. It's very tricky to troubleshoot. There's lots of components to it. It's the need for MSDP, which is still an experimental protocol as far as the IETF is concerned. So the idea over there in Internet 2 is they just wanted to drop to using SSM for interdomain stuff. And I think the question there was they were asking on their list as to what people thought of that, and there was generally support for doing so. Next slide. So the new draft, the structure of it is cut down, right down the, the, model, the, the model stuff is pretty much all gone. There's literally a page on the difference between ASM and SSM, brief discussion of their deployment, how they're deployed, um, and then into the advantages of SSM. And the bulk of the document now are the recommendations for what we should do and what we actually mean when we say deprecate into domain ASM, because you could interpret that in in many ways, and there's lots of side questions where we kind of need to nail down what we mean and have agreement um, on that. Oh. <laughs> Some of these torture things where they get you to hold a brick out at arm's length. Um, come on. <laughs> Next slide. It keeps, your, keeps the presentations uh, <sighs> focused. Um, so the, this is the abstract right at the start. So I guess if you want to quickly read that, and if you've got anything that any violent disagreement with what we say here is the highest level statement in the, in the abstract, then come to the microphone, well, <laughs> come to this microphone, I don't know, stand up and uh, express your objections. The little bit on blue on the end is the bit that Torlis has added. So if we bring Torlis on line, we've got a slightly updated version that we'll, we'll post. But it's basically saying, um, recommend the deprecation of ASM into domain, recommends use of SSM for into domain, um, and therefore that host and router is involved in into domain applications must fully support SSM. Um, but it also, and this is part of the pushback we had from adopting it before, makes it very clear that we're not saying, uh, we're not precluding continued use of ASM within a local domain for intra-domain um, use. Um, next slide. So what we mean by deprecating SSM for inter-domain? Um, there's a section 4.1 on that. So as I said, it's um, implicitly that all the host and routers uh, fully supporting SSM, thanks to Percy in the room. He's gone, been, been through this mammoth, <laughs> mammoth uh, journey of publishing uh, RFC 8313 on BCP for interdomain SSM. So um, that's a useful thing that we can now refer to for this. And importantly, um, you know, this applies both to MSDP as a method for doing interdomain ASM, but also embedded RP. So um, this is, I've kind of got this fond attachment in a way for embedded RP, but it's, it's kind of a victim in this. We're saying if we are going to deprecate uh, interdomain ASM, we mean for both V4 and V6 with the tools that are there um, for that. Um, it also recommends against the use of PMSM with an RP where the multicast tunnels are used between domains. Um, and something that Torlis suggested adding was um, a more inclusive interpretation, which might include devices under a different operator control where the multicast is sourced from a different operator. And the important thing is that we're not proposing to make MSDP historic. And again, that fits with not precluding the, the use of um, ASM within a, a single organizational domain stick. You might as well come up here because no one will hear you. You can hold this for a bit. You need, you need the Jabber Spire. Did you? Oh, you need the remote people to hear you. This I can help you hold it. Yes. <laughs> okay, this is Stig. So I was just wondering, do you deprecate embedded RP completely or just use it for interdomain? So use of it for interdomain. So maybe on the last bullet it should say not making MSDP or embedded RP historic. They're both. If you want to um, use that within your own domain, that's fine. Um, so for example, at the University asked previously out we used embedded RP for IPTV stuff. 
Yeah, I think it's no different than PIM, right? We're not we're not deprecating PIM ASM either. Uh, we're just saying don't use it for interdomain. Exactly. <clears throat> um, so everyone's happy generally with the points there. Good. Next slide. Um, and the implication here is network support for IGMPv3 and MODV2. So again, we're recommending that um, all hosts and routers uh, supporting multicast and also any security appliances, appliances handling it support both protocols. Um, I'm involved in the um, BIS version of RC6434, the IPv6 node requirements, and we've made MLDV2 a must for hosts there where it previously wasn't. Um, so that's kind of complementary to that. And also, if you've got things like snooping functions, they must support both protocols as well. Seems uncontroversial. Good. Next slide. Um, so yeah, the next topic is kind of then building the application support for SSM. So applications, we would prefer them to use SSM and operate correctly in an SSM environment, and obviously triggering the um, IGMP and IMLD messages um, as required. Um, we do note, oh, ah, oh, please. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we know we've got a note in there about the different um, programming languages and their support. And the main gap at the moment seems to be in um, WebSocket. So we've just noted that in the draft, whether we leave it in there in the final version or not. I'm going to be kind to you and give you this that actually works. So you don't have to Thank you very much. Good good minute for thanks for the it's definitely working. Early good morning workout. <laughs> it's hard as cooked. Where was I? Oh, yes. So, yeah, in Feasible, what we would like to recommend is that applications use SSM, um, even if their own, you know, even if they might be. We recommend that applications use SSM, even if they're in that intradomain environment where ASM is supported. The idea then is as more applications get deployed that use SSM rather than ASM, you may be able to prune back um, the way that. Um, multicast is used within your site. So you may have an environment that supports ASM applications and all the MSTP and all the other relative complexities of that. But if you slowly introduce more and more SSM applications, you can move to a point where you're only using SSM. So this is fits in again with the not precluding use of ASM, but we're saying you kind of want to move to a point where that's used less and less, I think. Um, and yeah, the thing in bold at the bottom, we're sort of implicitly pushing the source discovery to something that isn't the network layer above the network layer, some out of, relative out of band thing. So there's still the complexity of discovering the sources somewhere, it's just not in the network. Next slide. Um, we've noted a couple of things that might be, or we think it would be good things for the IETF to work on, or the MBOND, or whichever group it would be in. Um, one would be guidance on converting ASM applications to SSM. Uh, and the other would be best practice for SSM applications in some <coughs> greenfield design or greenfield um, deployment area. And the other would be a mapping mechanism to translate um, star Gs to SGs. Um, now, different vendors have different ways of doing that. I know Cisco and Juniper have mechanisms for that, and they've been around for a long time. They're not really standardized methods, though. So the ITF perhaps defining a consistent and common way of, of doing that might be useful. Um, but we would emphasize that it should be an, viewed as an interim solution, not something that would be there long term. But as hinted in very faint font there, interim things do tend to stay around for some time. Um, so, you know, no one coming to the mic is kind of good in a way, I suppose. Next slide. Um, I mentioned this um, last time, actually. I mean, in theory, if you're deprecating ASM into domain, you might make an argument to filter out. Um, ASM traffic that you see into domain, but our view is that you shouldn't be doing that um, because if you have this mapping mechanism in place, you'd kind of preclude that from working potentially. So that might be something that the MOD might recommend in the future, but at this stage, we wouldn't say that you should do that. Next slide. Um, and again, yes, emphasizing we're not precluding use of intradomain. Um, obviously, it's intradomain ASM is still very common in enterprises and campuses today. Um, and there's some text I've cut and pasted from the document there to 
emphasize that. So if you want to have a quick glance at that and see whether that's something you agree with, um, that's fine. If you object, maybe come to the mic now. Um, okay, uh, next slide. So that's basically a sort of a summary of what's now in the draft, and you can see the much clearer focus on deprecation of ASM, not precluding use of uh, inter-domain ASM, not precluding intra-domain ASM, but also encouraging um, deployment of SSM intra, well, everywhere, essentially. Um, so that's it. Are there any comments, feedback? Is it something that you'd want to adopt now as a working group item now it's been reshaped? Any strong feelings on it? Just a mic, mic me, Brian. Just a quick question. What is the state of interdomain multicast? I haven't. What's the state of interdomain multicast? Well, that's a very good question. Um, is it how much is actually in use? Yes. Um, we, we might be, be able to answer that question a little bit better in the next uh, presentation. Uh, it's a stick. It's not just one comment on that, and maybe for this draft too. Uh, it could be worth maybe separating between into domain as in like you know random people can talk to each other, and into domain in the sense that you have say a content provider peering with an a ISP, right? Um, so I don't know in this draft if you want to call that out in particular, whether this applies to just like sort of like two domains that are you know have a close relationship to each other. Or if it's really just like into the main, that's like sort of random people. Okay, that could be a, a good point to include. Hopefully that's been minuted. Yeah, Michael, I, um, I think we discussed this here before that um, it's, it's very common that you have like a head end or something that one entity is running and uh, like for TV channels and just injecting all the channels. Yeah. I don't re really know if that should be called interdomain at all mm. in the, like it's not two AES numbers necessarily speaking <clears throat> to each other. So uh, I don't know. How much so yeah, maybe more having a little section discussing what we actually mean by interdomain. Yeah, it, it could be like we're actually talking now about two different ISPs basically over the internet or something to trying to do this, and that's not that shouldn't be done. But uh, I, I don't know how much that we, I, I don't want the draft to like become huge yeah. either. That's but well, yeah, we, we could have a little bit of text on that. I think I remember looking at that internet two thread, and there were things on there like you know, the 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 NREN essentially offering to run RP services for the sites and all the traffic hairpinning around and there's all and the universities don't necessarily have any relationship with each other they kind of have a relationship with the NREN but it's the NREN saying this is unnecessary complexity for us to run we believe we're not seeing much ASM into the main traffic we would like to see things SSM for our simplification of our operations yeah and I mean we're not the internet police either so we can't stop people no, from no. doing things it's just saying you know you, you, this is just a B I presume yep. this would be a BCP um, which you can follow or not of course at least until we get our police force up and up, hey. up and working and then we can start <laughs> knocking oh, heads geez. there's a draft on that one. yeah uh, so just a, a sign of hands, who, who has read the most recent version of the draft, this updated version? Um, yes, it is. It's, it's, it was posted before the cutoff. It's okay. just not called multicast models. It's called the new name. And I've not with the tallest comments. No, sorry. Okay. But those I've gone through that with a fine tooth comb. He's basically put his sort of air of experience into it and added some useful He's not changed the thrust of anything um, at all there, except that comment about, and it's what you raised, Mikhail, about what's into domain. Is it the provider and the set-top box operator? Is it? And I think on the feedback, we would look at defining the what we mean by into domain a bit more cleanly. But yes, the zero zero is what's out there now. Great. Um, so it looks like two people have raised their hands um, of the two. Do you think it's ready for, uh, would you support adoption? Or uh, how about other folks in the room who haven't read it, but have been paying attention for the last 10 minutes? Who's been paying attention? Um, hands up. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, the other folks in the room, just a show of hands, uh, who would support, who, who thinks that this uh, would support adoption for this, just non-binding? All right, looks like about seven or eight or so. Anybody would be opposed to it? Okay, zero. It's a landslide. 
Yeah, it's, uh, it's, can't get more agreement than that. Um, all right, so we'll take it to the list. It sounds okay. like it's ready for a, an adoption call uh, on right. this latest um, rev. Any thoughts about your second bullet? What should be done? Is this another document? Any, anybody else have comments oh, or yes. thoughts? Um, I think at the moment we would just park the content that was basically all being thrown out until this is done and dusted. And there may be shifts in opinion on this, so yeah. get this one done and then move on from there. But there's the other two potential drafts that we could start working on now about um, converting ASM applications to SSM and the mapping thing. Maybe discuss those on the list. Yeah. A anybody have any comments on these three things, either the, the old models uh, or the BCP to convert or the documenting mapping mechanisms? Uh, Rob Evans, just, uh, do we need um, this protocol map map mapping mechanism if we're deprecating into the main ASM? What are the applications we're supporting? It seems like a lot of work for what might be a very limited use. And, it's going to, and whether it will hang around in the future to um, be a millstone around, around our necks. Yeah, certainly the, I mean, I hinted at the millstone thing with a very faint text <laughs> uh, on that slide. I mean, it would enable applications that for some reason can only work ASM to actually work into domain because they would then be able to effectively talk SSM through the mapping mechanism. Yeah, Jake Holland, the other answer I've heard to that is uh, there's legacy hardware that does IGMP snooping, but not V3 SSM. And so sometimes you can't get forwarding without uh, to to your through your access network or your LAN uh, without the application using V2. Uh, I mean, it's essentially a society thing. We can progress this BCP without that mapping mechanism, but it. What would be interesting to hear are people with applications uh, or places where if the BCP get advances, they will say, but wait, I know, can't do this because all my stuff only talks ASM, only talks RGMP v2 and MLD v1, for example. Uh, I, hopefully there aren't many of those, but... Yeah, Michael Abramson. So I, I don't know if we put text in there, but we had that discussion about supporting MLD v3 doesn't mean you're supporting S, G joins. Do, do we actually have text that states that? You should so, support S, G joins over MLD v3? MLDV3. Uh, MLDV2, sorry. Yeah, I got the IGMP. But uh, like the source, uh, just be, I mean, you can do Stark G joins over IGMP. Oh, right. Yes. And MLDV3. So, so I think it does actually, say. Because the point is S, G joins, not the specific yes. version that actually yeah, supports that's, it. That's worth minuting, and we should clarify that. Yeah. Yeah, because this is uh, sort of about the snooping functionality there as well. I mean, it also needs to support that part. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. But, but because I, I've, I've run into. Uh, vendor equipment that did support MLD v2, but did not support S committee joins. Okay. Uh, just quick comments because we're running low on time. So. Okay. So stick. So um, <clears throat> I think you know, even though we try to help people port their applications to SSM, which we should. I like the idea of this draft at the bottom there. It will take a while for you know to get rid of ASM applications. Oh yes, and they so, might never go away. So it is definitely useful to have those uh, mapping mechanisms there. But we need to document it in the IETF. I'm not quite sure, but uh, yeah, might be cool. okay to do. I remember your mapping mechanism from about the, 15 years. The thing years though ago. is, if we actually sort of like standardize, say everyone should support this mapping mechanism, then there might be less less incentive to port applications to SSM. Yeah, that's the logic by which 6XS got rid of their tunnel broker, isn't it? Is that uh, school of thought? Yeah. Uh, right, Jake Cohen. The um, it, uh, on a similar point, the uh, are there examples of of uh, BCPs about converting applications? that we have to work from? Um, not that I'm aware of. That's why there's a suggestion that we might want to write one. OK. Uh, I, I might be Just able to help suggestion. on that if if it seems worthwhile. Um, I don't think it's going to be a huge document. But, uh, OK, good. So it's a gap, I think, in, in Bondi's arsenal at the moment. Yeah, these seem like good comments. Thanks. OK. Great. Well, thank you. So let's take, uh, take those comments to the list. We'll take the adoption call to the list. Um, okay, William on uh, Meet Echo, are you uh, ready to ready to go? Yep. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. All right, William. 
are you able to project the slides or do we project the slides for him? Anybody done Meet Echo before? William, can you bring, can you, uh, does Meet Echo allow you to bring the slide up or is it? Uh, uh, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Then I will bring your slide up here. You can also use the uh, PowerPoint that I sent you. Or um, I have. I get the hide the sidebar. There we go. Um, I did not update uh, with the latest. Uh, so this is what you sent yesterday. All right. Okay, you are ready to go. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is William Zhang. Uh, I'm a senior at Thomas Jefferson High School in uh, Alexandria, uh, commonly more known as uh, TJ. And my project today is my research project, uh, a public AMT relay between Internet 2 and the commodity to Internet. Uh, so next slide. Uh, I'm not seeing the slides for some reason. Oh, there we go. Um, so my project involves deploying the MX80 as a public AMT relay. I have the support of uh, the school's network administrator, which is Mr. Maraska, uh, Peter Maraska, and uh, Lenny Giuliano, of course. Uh, and they've been helping me set this up. Uh, and one of the things I'm trying to do is catalog and curate what's already there uh, on the M bone. So for multicast content, uh, we want to provide like an easy way for internet end users to get that content. Uh, and to do that, I needed to look at, you know, what, what AMT gateways we already have. Um, and I also needed to figure out how to provide simple guidance to content owners to, uh, you know, provide more multicast content. So next slide. And the goals I'm trying to get here are, um, uh, I want to deliver multicast content from Internet 2 uh, to unicast only receivers on the commodity Internet. Uh, and this is a unicast only administrative domain to a multicast enabled administrative donate domain model, you know, described in uh, 8313, section 3.4. So if you want to look at this model, I guess you can uh, read that. Uh, and another goal of uh, my project is to gain experience, prove viability, and develop uh, best practices for running uh, the relay. And uh, yeah, so next slide. For some reason, the slides keep going black when you uh, go forward, for some reason. Yeah, it takes a little while for them to come up. Yeah. Uh, so you can see here, this is what uh, our setup looks like. So we at TJ are special because we have a 10 gig peer-to-peer -peer link uh, to Virginia Tech, and we get native multicast uh, connectivity to Internet 2 uh, via that connection. So. Uh, we're able to receive native multicast uh, from Internet 2. Uh, as, as many of you know, uh, Internet 2 contains a lot of uh, M-Bone. Uh, and yeah, so uh, our AMT relay sits on the TJ border network, and we can receive uh, native multicast video or other content from Internet 2 and relay building an AMT tunnel to the commodity Internet. Uh, to interested receivers via Virginia Tech. So we have a 10 gig link to Virginia Tech and a one gig link to the commodity internet. Uh, and so the significance of this uh, is that we potentially have the first public AMT relay on the M-Bone. Uh, and yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I guess I'll just bring up my own slides so I don't have to wait. Sorry. Oh yeah, I got it. Um, so if you don't have any content, there's no point in building an AMT relay uh, or having AMT gateway. Uh, so we need to look at what content we have already on Internet 2. 
Internet 2 actually does provide a nice service called the Internet 2 Looking Glass that's hosted by Indiana University and lets you run commands on Internet 2 routers on the web interface. And I'm interested in looking at the output of show multicast route detail, but there are too many routers to do by hand. There's like at least 50. Um, so I just wrote a Python script uh, and they looked at the request endpoint that this form was sending to. And I parsed the, all the responses from each router and I just reformatted into stuff that I, uh, that, that's, that's useful to me. Uh, and you can look at the uh, code that I used uh, here on GitHub. So next slide. So uh, my methodology for collecting data, uh, I needed to filter out anything that didn't have a packet rate more than five, five packets per second uh, because uh, we're looking for interesting content here and anything with less than that is probably not very interesting. Uh, and uh, the other problem with this is that uh, any uh, output at any given time isn't actually representative of what that source is because uh, if you don't have any interested receivers, a, no a source won't necessarily show up in the input. Um, so to combat this, I actually just uh, ran my script as a cron job for every two hours for over a month. So I collect collected like a couple hundred logs. Um, and at the end, when I have all the logs, uh, I just wrote another script to just sort them and figure out uh, who is operating these sources via uh, who is uh, data. Uh, so next slide. Uh, and, and just to add, um, the, the five packets per second was selected somewhat uh, arbitrarily as, uh, like, as William said, to, to find interesting content. There's a lot of, uh, there's hundreds of um, uh, streams out there that, you know, had less than two packets per second. Uh, most likely those were beacons. Um, so we weren't interested in seeing beacons. Um, so to kind of filter that out, we just used uh, uh, five packets per second as a as a threshold. Yep. So you can look at the raw data we got here. Um, this is on GitHub too. Uh, I also included another link with the results with the who is included. Uh, and so overall, you can see that we have 119 unique multicast sources and 40 unique multicast groups on Internet 2. Um, and the three most interesting ones that I found are uh, this first one, which we've been actually actively using to test. Uh, this one is George Mason, but uh, as far as I can tell, it's also National Science Foundation TV. Uh, I don't know if there's an association there, but uh, yeah. Uh, and also we can see the Red Iris, uh, some company in Spain, and then we also have uh, EU Metsat with the highest packet rate by far. So all three of these I've tested out, and they're all video with audio. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess that's good. Next slide. So uh, with this content, obviously, uh, if you're going to deliver it to your customer networks, you're going to need uh, an AMC gateway. Uh, and uh, I've been looking at what's already out there for gateway implementations. And the first one I've seen uh, was the UT Dallas implementation for VLC. Uh, you can look at it at this one here. Uh, it works, but it's outdated. It's on VLC like 0.9. Uh, and it's also Windows only. But it's what I found to work the best so far. It's a little bit buggy. Uh, sometimes it'll crash. Uh, I'm not sure why, uh, but yeah. Uh, another implementation I looked at was uh, U-Pipe's work. Uh, they actually made this really cool demo with NACL, native client. Uh, it lets you run native code in the browser. Uh, it actually uh, apparently works, but I haven't actually been able to get it to work. Uh, I've been told by the U-Pipe guys that it works, but Neither me nor Lenny have gotten it working. Uh, another big problem uh, with this is that it's using NACL. Um, it's Chrome specific, um, Chrome specific, and it's actually no longer supported by Google. Uh, they disbanded the team uh, last year. 
Uh, and it's also SSM only, but that doesn't seem like a big problem uh, based on the previous presentation, uh, since we're deprecating ASM for inner domain. Um, and uh, finally, I also actually know I have more, uh, but uh, I looked at UT Dallas's reference implementation. Uh, I think Concordia did some work on that too. Um, it's AMT GWD, it's Unix only. Uh, I've been able to get it to compile and run but it's bundled with gproxy. Uh, it's an IGMPV through proxy implementation. Uh, I haven't been able to get that to compile. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, whether you know it works completely or not. Uh, so next slide. So I also looked at Greg, Bumgard Greg Bumgardner's work um, with js 4 ms uh, Java SDK for multicast services. I actually made my own fork. Uh, it needed, I just made a couple changes uh, to try to make it work. But uh, the major problem with it is that it's missing the documentation. Um, and uh, Greg also told me that I can use a self sync certificate, so I can't actually run JNLP once I've built it. So that's a big barrier to using that. Um, but I've also, uh, there's also a very promising. Uh, implementation by Jake, who I think is here. Uh, and I also forked it. Uh, I just changed two lines to get it to work on my end. Um, and I got it to compile on none. Uh, it also needs an IGMP v3 proxy, but uh, it uses uh, MicProxy, uh, which is actively developed. I don't actually know if you can use MicProxy with the UT Dallas slash Concordia implementation. Um, so I haven't tried that quite yet. Um, I also haven't gotten around to actually testing this one fully either. Um, and so finally, we also have Cisco SSM AMT tools. Uh, this is, as far as I can tell, the only available uh, AMT library uh, for like embedded, uh, AM embedded AMT library. So um, it's useful for like building your own standalone thing. Um, it has pretty decent documentation, as far as I can tell. Uh, like they document every function, you know, what it does, how to use it. Uh, so that's pretty good, and that makes things easy. Um, so next slide. So uh, with all these gateway implementations out there, um, there's not really a clear, uh, you know, best solution. Uh, obviously, the VLC uh, mentioned earlier does work, but it's severely outdated, and it's Windows, and it's buggy. Uh, so the logical step here would be to integrate it into a new version of VLC and also port it to all the other platforms. Um, VLC, as many of you know, is pretty widely supported in the industry, um, and it's also, I mean, it's cross-platform, but I'd assume you have to uh, write specific code for each platform anyways. Um, but another idea um, I've been looking at is WebAssembly. So WebAssembly, uh, if you guys don't know, uh, it's a new technology. It's meant to replace NACL, but it's also cross-platform. It's supported by Google, Microsoft, Mozilla um, on all of their browsers. And um, one of my ideas is to build an in-browser uh, implementation similar to what Upipe did uh, with their NACL demo. But obviously, with WebAssembly, uh, that's actively supported. Um, but it's very new. Uh, I, I think it really only got, um, you know, uh, accepted last year as a, uh, I guess, a standard. Uh, so there's not really that much out there so far. But uh, yeah, uh, if anyone has any ideas on how to do this, uh, I greatly appreciate the help. Uh, and Next slide. One, one more slide. And finally, we also have, uh, you can try out our public AMT relay to download the VLC with uh, AMT gateway implementation in it uh, from this link and just follow these instructions and you can try out the, uh, the source that we showed on the other slide. So thanks for listening, I guess. Hi, William, uh, there is a question. Yep. Uh, hi, Jay Collin. So, yep, uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Um, 
if you go back one uh, slide there. Yeah, so the WebAssembly, I've also looked at this. The problem right now is that there's no UDP support. So it would need, oh. yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna have a problem with that. Um, one, there are a couple of workarounds proposed the, a, a good direction to look if you wanna pursue this uh, would be there was a WebRTC data channel uh, standalone um, the hackathon project this uh, last hackathon. So you might want to check into that as a wrapper for UDP if you're desperate enough or you might mm. <laughs> look into I getting mean, it. Right now, I, I don't have any experience with WebAssembly. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I was just looking at it. Uh, I'm not really sure where to start with that. Yeah, uh, so I would just recommend that this this WebAssembly idea is going to be a challenge for the moment. Mm -hmm. And thanks, this is very interesting. Appreciate getting it all together. Yep, thank you. Hi, uh, Lucas Pardew, BBC R&D. Um, so I was also at the hackathon uh, working with uh, Jake and um, part of that was to try and get some of our uh, multicast quick uh, video distribution demonstrated in a web browser. So we, we looked at some of this for not so much the AMT side of things, but on um, deserializing quick packets within the web browser. So we, we use the mscripting tool to take a C++ based quick deserializer library and get that converted into WebAssembly and mm -hmm. spotted many issues along the way. Um, threading's a big one there. Um, and there's lots of mm -hmm. uh, gaps between, say, depending on how you want to implement this as a web app, um, certain mm -hmm. capabilities are not available in things like service workers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, and yeah, we you can't deliver things uh, UDP multicast into that context. So rather than web RTC, uh, we chose web sockets as something uh, oh, well, I see. a little bit more straightforward. Um, so we were able to demonstrate some of that at the hackathon and presented some slides on that that are on the public GitHub repo. Um, so you might want to have a look at that if interested. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, it's uh, Rob Evans. Um, I, I just want to go back to the sources. I was wondering, as well as uh, scraping active sources, did you have a look to see if anyone was still advertising things in SAP STP to um, get the get the source group uh, for that and try joining those? Uh, Lenny, do you want to handle that one? Yeah, I, I don't think we looked at SAP or STP. Uh, it, we were we were just trying to look at what's on the actual routers uh, and to see what people are joining. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a thought. I, I um, I'm not sure what applications still what, any applications you recommend that still have. I don't know. SDR. No, I, was, I was just wondering if, if there was some legacy stuff there around and <laughs> might still be using it. Uh, yeah. The other thing is just for there, there is uh, there is traffic on the um, on the SAP group, yeah. so somebody's using it. And, and just for information, uh, Red Iris is the Spanish RNA network, is the equivalent of Internet 2 in Spain. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, EUMETSAT, that's a fairly interesting project. It was set up for distribution of uh, meteorological data that comes in by satellite into Germany and is spread out to certainly the European um, Met agencies. I'm surprised to see it popping up on the uh, Internet 2. Router. Yeah, they, they actually, uh, EMETSAT actually has a, uh, their website and they, it's on purpose. Um, they, they, uh, it's a service they offer uh, to folks who are connected to uh, the MBONE or, you know, the I2 networks and uh, you can join that content. Yeah, I mean, in parallel to setting up EUMETSAT, we also set up a whole bunch of measurement infrastructure along with it. So each EUMETSAT official point has a beacon and is a private beacon group. So it, it, it was set up as a, uh, only maybe three, four years, uh, maybe a bit more, a uh, uh, group with a, an infrastructure, measurement infrastructure around it as well. So. Yeah. The, the interesting thing about EUMETSAT is they're, they're, they're the only ones that seems to be using SSM right now. Um, and, and it's a pretty high bit rate. Uh, so. Um, yeah, so, so Greg, this, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Mike, this kind of answers your question as to what is the state of, you know, the M bone today. There's, there's stuff out there, not a lot. Um, uh, 
one of the things that was disappointing was the state of the AMT gateway uh, implementations. A lot of the work on AMT gateways has been Unix, Unix based with the plans to stick it into um, uh, routers. Um, you know, we're tr if we remember the original purpose of AMT was for end users, you know, at their laptops or, you know, smartphones or this is before smartphones. But the goal of AMT is to bypass, uh, have end users access multicast content. Um, so uh, the, 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 uh, the gateway implementations that exist today uh, don't really, um, uh, we're, we're struggling to get them to facilitate that model. So uh, that's a little disappointing. Um, that's a little bit outside, well, it's well outside my uh, expertise in, you know, in, in working with William. So um, William and I would certainly welcome any assistance from folks who would like to help uh, the VLC idea, since VLC is so widely deployed and it's available on many platforms. Um, uh, you know, up, ha, updating VLC with AMT functionality would be wonderful. Uh, we're not quite sure where to get started. So if anybody knows anyone who has ever done any VLC development, um, we, we welcome guidance. Um, yeah, Jake. Uh, hi, Jake. This, uh, one more suggestion of AMT resources. There's a, uh, a Cisco CSR 1000V uh, virtual image. You can download that has AMT gateway support uh, built in. Um, and then uh, one last question about the data here. Um, I guess I can check offline if you don't know offhand, but do you have it, uh, it does it say whether um, whether these are SSM, uh, whether there are RPs for the, uh, for the groups? Uh, uh, do we know um, the, uh, are these joinable via SSM or ASM at the moment with the interdomain? I believe the George Mason one is ASM, um, but I'm not completely sure. I, I, I think the EU MetSat is pretty much the only SSM stuff. There's not a lot of 232 addresses. Uh, the, the others, the non-232 addresses, I would assume does have RP mappings. Uh, the, if you look at the MSDP essays, there's over 2,000 MSDP essays in the uh, global cache. So um, the 239s, I think, could be either way, correct? The glob can be sort of done. 239 shouldn't be appearing. Uh, 239 is administratively scoped. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it shouldn't it shouldn't be there, but it there. I think there might have been some stuff. Thank All you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, William. Uh, uh, great work. Yep. Right. Okay, next up, uh, why don't we bring Sandy up uh, and then Mike, you can finish with your last two. Sure, come on down. Hmm. Yeah, we're gonna have to keep this quick to about five to 10. Eight, five minutes, can you do it? Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Zhen Zhang from ZTE. Uh, you can call me Sandy. Uh, this, this presentation is for multicast young model. Um, we have we had presented it for many times. Um, today we will make a brief introduction of the update of this draft. Uh, in this draft, we also have co-author Yin Chen from China Unicom. Uh, let's see the brief update of this draft. Um, according to young doctor's suggestion, we changed the draft name from information model to young model because information model has special meaning in some other SDOS, such as the uh, ONF or other organ organization. So we change the name to avoid confusion. And uh, next we do some, uh, not next, please, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, uh, and we do some writing improves according to young doctor's suggestion. So the main content of the model is unchanged, but we add more uh, description to make it more clear. And also we add some notifications. Uh, it's still the modification of this draft. Um, somebody has seen it, um, saw it many times. 
So uh, we just introduced it briefly. So this job, uh, this model is stand at a high level to take advantage of the existing pro, uh, multicast protocol uh, young models to uh, implement the multicast service. Let's see the, this page. This is a brief introduction of Open Daylight organization. Uh, because Open Daylight provides a, a model driven platform to um, implement the mo um, several services, um, includes uh, L2, uh, L3PN and the other functions. So we can use the platform to uh, verify our model. Next. So this is the uh, project in open daylight you can see the you can get the more information from this link um the project is drawn by two young models the first one is the multicast model defined here and the other is the pure protocol young data model so this model has been verified in this project and the project has been released in carbon version of open daylight so this model is feasible and practicable um, in the, uh, we also provide a UML-like class diagram to make it uh, more clear. Uh, in this diagram, we just move out the multicast keys uh, to make it more clear, so you can understand it very well. Yes. Uh, it's still the content of this model. It's remain unchanged. We have three layers in the model. Uh, next. So we know that the uh, overlay, underlay, and the transport lay always may remain unchanged this time. Um, we just uh, add some notifications for it. So we, uh, until now, we add some note down restart event and the module loaded or unloaded events for it. So that's all. Mm, it seems like it has been adopted since last meeting. Right. Uh, Appreciate it. Oh yeah, we're, uh, we're ready for the call. I think uh, so. A question. Uh, uh, just a quick show of hands. Who who has read uh, the updated, the most recent one? Um, okay. And uh, another two hands. Um, other folks in the room, uh, it seemed like last time, and there was support for uh, adoption pending comments back from the Yang doctors. We did get comments back from the Yang doctors. Um, you updated it based on that feedback. Uh, feedback from the room, folks who would uh, support adoption, any hands? Okay, it's about five, six. Uh, anybody oppose adoption of this doc? Okay, zero, that's a good sign. So we can take that to the list. Um, I just wanted to say thanks. This is one of the more readable Yang models that I've encountered yet, and I appreciate your efforts to, to make that happen. I, thanks, I hope Jake. that your techniques are adopted widely. Thank you, Jake. Great. Cool, so we'll take that to the list. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, Mike, you're up. You can take us home. Okay. All right. So I'm not going to actually go through my slides. If you can just bring up the, the original slide, the, the cover slide. Um, I'm panicking a bit just it's for the PIM side. We may have to cut a, a presentation or two. So let me just state that there is this draft. We've had it for several years now. Um, I was encouraged to resurrect it, and I did. Uh, it's a draft that um, kind of spawned off from ARMD working group, which is now concluded. That working group um, was address resolution for massive numbers of devices. And the idea is, in this, in our draft, is to look at the, the use of multicast in the data center um, as a use case uh, type of a draft. Um, and so uh, it's been updated. Uh, there may, there, there's been changes in data center architecture over the last few years since this draft was created. Um, It'd be good to get some feedback. I would love to have a co-author or two. So if anybody's interested, it's a already working group draft. You get an easy name on a draft if you want. And um, I'd love to work with someone to 
to see how we can maybe update it with most re relevant information on the use of multicast in the data center. And that, with that, let's go to Charlie. Okay, great. So um, yeah, that's a, this is a really good draft and uh, love to see folks, uh, love to see this, that this draft advance uh, and progress. Uh, blue sheets, please sign the blue sheets. Can we not sign the blue? Actually, I um, sign okay. <laughs> when it comes back. All right, uh, 15 minutes. It's half and half, or oh. what, Pim? How, how long? We've as, got an hour and a half. We're already oh, screwed. Okay. Just because we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. Um, I'm Charlie Perkins, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, this group for adopting this draft. It was uh, adopted, and Mike and I had uh, worked on the draft uh, some years ago, and uh, as Mike said, it was re resurrected. But also, uh, in parallel, a draft had been done. Oh, next slide, please. Uh, I'll just go through it in order. So basically, the reason why this draft is interesting to Imbone, and this is a development from the previous presentation that Mike made. But basically, Imbone is the place where uh, people take care of the deployment of multicast, multicast technology. And this uh, draft that uh, I'll be discussing is all about the deployment and what's going on. So we want to uh, uh, have uh, awareness of multicast over wireless and Wi-Fi and uh, make sure that the practice is improved so that we can really get better uh, performance and provide uh, uh, feedback to the other working groups. And this may be actually the most important thing because uh, the way IPv6 was designed uh, was not, uh, let's say, particularly careful about how it would affect over multicast, I mean, over wireless. Next slide, please. So the issues are that uh, for, for multicast over wireless ends up really uh, being constrained by the slowest local recipient and that means that it can be drastically slower than unicast. And since it's uh, slower, it also occupies the medium for longer and increases the uh, uh, amount, amount of interference. And since also it needs to be uh, multicast to be received by the most uh, uh, distant re local receiver, uh, that means it could require higher power. And all in all, uh, it is not uncommon for this to uh, generate hundreds of times as much interference and actually uh, hundreds of times uh, slower performance, pretty much for the same reasons. Another factor that's uh, pretty important is that the reliability of multicast uh, can be a lot less than unicast. And there are several reasons for this, but basically for 802.11 at least, uh, all the manufacturers have been super careful to optimize for unicast so they can get good performance that way and multicast is, is simply not considered as important up until now. And uh, in particular, you can uh, get, uh, commonly you can get acknowledgements for unicast, but the multicast at layer two is not acknowledged. So uh, IPv6 neighbor discovery is uh, based on uh, multicast design and it ends up saturating the link. And that actually has a, uh, sort of a back pressure effect as well on the wired parts of the link if you have Wi-Fi and uh, wired links in the same uh, subnet. And so that uh, means that uh, some apps like Bonjour as an example, uh, saturate. And th these problems are not likely to be fixed anytime soon. I mentioned that there was a, a parallel effort. Uh, an int area had been submitted. And uh, this was actually another document uh, show this, this one here. Uh, it had co-authors from uh, uh, Dorothy Stanley, J.C. Zaniga, and, and Warren. is Warren here? This is his group. So uh, anyway, uh, so we got together and put together a lot of text uh, to describe the problem and some workarounds and some solutions and what uh, uh, had been noticed at uh, conferences like IETF. So Dorothy in the IEEE, she's the chair of 82.11 now as of last week or two weeks ago. Um, she made a presentation in 82.11 and uh, this 
stands for 2015. So it was a couple or three years ago, uh, but there was a, a concerted effort in .11 to uh, put, you know, make awareness of these uh, problems. And then that was that presentation was brought in uh, Int area, and uh, uh, Dan Harkins made a presentation from that. And then subsequent to that, we got together and made a draft, submitted it to Int area, and uh, as I'll, I'll mention in a couple of minutes, it was uh, pretty clear that the, the effort in the int area was almost the same as the effort for the draft that Mike and I had done earlier. And so eventually uh, it was suggested that those two efforts be merged. And so the new, uh, new sections in the current uh, draft that includes this merged information is uh, some new sections in the draft. There's uh, issues of layer two and below, issues of layer three and above, and some optimizations to uh, alleviate the problems, of what we call protocol optimizations. And then uh, uh, Warren contributed uh, some text on operational optimizations that are in the draft, and then multi-class considerations for other wireless media, in particular, uh, 802.15. So uh, uh, next slide, please. So here's some of the uh, uh, protocol optimizations that are described in the draft. There's a proxy ARP uh, specification for 82.11, and there's um, uh, proxy neighbor discovery for IPv6 and address registration. By the way, uh, there's also um, a draft RFC 6775 update that has uh, some specification for uh, proxy neighbor discovery in um, Ripple-based systems. Important for wireless devices, battery-powered wireless devices, is trying to save power. And the way they do that is by uh, going to sleep for a while. And uh, that can be inter that can interfere with a proper reception of multicast. Uh, for instance, if the uh, access point is trying to uh, send out multicast to the uh, sleeping devices, well, they can wake up get a packet that doesn't belong to their, they don't really need it because they're not in that multicast group and try to go back to sleep. There's also some other IPv6 support in the 802.11-2012. And by the way, there's a new 802.11 roll-up coming out, I think soon, like it's almost done. Uh, but I'm sure all this will still be in there. Uh, one time honored technique is to, well, let's just don't do multicast anyway if you've only got two or three receivers locally for the multicast group, you might as well just unicast to both of them, or all three of them, or whatever. And it's a matter of uh, arithmetic to figure out when you should stop using unicast and start using multicast uh, to deliver the packets. Yes, question? Yeah, about that, uh, this is Jake. Um, section 4.5, I think it was, uh, I would love to see filled out. But um, sounds like an interesting technique that just had the one sentence that it happens. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, in the in the draft, the one that's up there, okay. I, I think it just. Uh, I would love to see some elucidation of how that works. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's a standard for it or what exactly. I didn't find anything obvious, um, but. Um, well, it, standards. You know, which standard? I guess I think there's actually something in that AAA for that. Just a reference to the appropriate standards would okay. be great. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll take note of that. And then there's a, okay, so basically, um, I think it frequently is just said that uh, um, in some graphs I've seen, if you want to do multicast, you're allowed to convert it to unicast to all the receivers that are locally. And, they're, and, and that, I think, has been considered to be sufficient specification. IEEE uh, has created several approaches for this problem. One of them is called a direct multicast service, which is pretty much that. In other words, instead of blasting it out to everybody, you're directing it to each particular receiver. And then for this problem I mentioned before about uh, multicast not being acknowledged, uh, there's something called group cast with retries, uh, GCR, which provides a layer two acknowledgement for multicast. Uh, next slide, please. So there's some other um, workarounds that are mentioned and this, uh, there's a little bit more about the traffic class idea on the next slide. 
uh, reliable registration and can help. Um, so the whole idea of re reliability and multicast over uh, Wi-Fi and 802.15, and maybe even especially 802.15, um, is problematic because uh, in the case of 15, uh, they all thought this was all the responsibility of the higher layers and never specified it. In the case of dot 11, uh, Unicast is just economically way more important. And so we also uh, could uh, suggest some new approaches to help save battery life. And so uh, try to arrange it to work. You don't have to wake up for every multicast packet. That would help a lot. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, uh, I guess it was about a month and a half ago or two months ago uh, that I did do the merge, or we did we did the merge between the int area document and the um, and the inbound document. Uh, but before that, Joel is Joel here, Joel Jigley. He had provided he had read both documents, and his first comment was. There's no need for two different documents. Okay, so we merged the documents. And, uh, but he had some other uh, relevant comments as well. Uh, what's the audience for the document? And what problems are gonna be solved in ITF versus IEEE and, and so on. So uh, he asked four specifically, four specific questions. And these are my answers currently, but this group is, should uh, you know decide really what the answers are? So advice to implementers, I think clearly is yes. IEEE, um, well, IEEE has a lot to do with you know, the specification for the actual layer two. So the more they know about the problems we're having, or the let's say the mindset of IETF, the better job they can do. And so uh, it's not targeted targeted towards IEEE, but they will almost certainly see it. And, besi and besides that, there is an IEEE IETF coordination committee that is aware of this draft. Is there any water around here? I'll go get you some. Suddenly out of yeah, mass water. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we need to have uh, some division of labor between I IETF and IEEE. And once this draft progresses and we get more comments on the mailing list, I think it'll be uh, uh, we'll be a better able to uh, uh, discuss this, Michael. Yeah, Michael Abramson. Uh, <laughs> so this is not directly related to this, but I I've had I've seen devices where you turn on IGMP snooping, it turns off any other Ethernet multicast. So V6 ISIS doesn't work anymore. Uh, do we have like implementation advice for people implementing those kinds of functionality? Because there are obviously so some of them are doing it wrong. Like they turn off all other, they turn off Ethernet multicast, uh, and, and and that's. I mean, there there is an IGMP snooping draft, and I it's been a while, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't say turn off everything when you turn I, I this off. It specifically say don't do certain certain things yeah. when it comes to that. Well, I think the idea is if your whole city's on fire, you'd rather turn the fire off and lose a few buildings instead. <laughs> But you're right, this would be done much more effectively to let the application run and use multicast in an effective way. Right. So my point was not on, this is, my point was not specifically for Wi-Fi. It was, this is like a layer two switch wired has this problem. I, I know these devices. A, so I know plenty of people who, okay, I have to turn off IGMP snooping, otherwise, you know, a lot of other things doesn't work. Um, so, but this is all about 802. I would say generically, do, do we want, is this another thing that we should work on? It is not specifically for what you're talking about here. Well, I think that, you know, really the, at, the, at the very heart of it are certain things about physics that can't be overcome. And so that's not specific 802, but my background is a lot more about 802 than I don't know. And I know a little bit about LTE and so on, but I know a lot more about that. Uh, oh, okay. And, I meant wired versus wireless oh, in wired IEEE. Versus, right. So I think that this draft really should concentrate on wireless. Okay. And because the main uh, problems that are discussed here and uh, the reason and the motivation for the draft was all wireless and exactly how it is 
I mean, anyway, the, the, when uh, multicast was developed, or IPv6 was developed assuming multicast, they were well aware of the wired characteristics of multicast. Uh, one more minute. Okay. Well, so next slide, please. Um, well, I've already touched on most of these, so I, I don't have to. Uh, oh, one thing I'd like to mention, though, it really would be nice if we could essentially determine what is our goal for uh, multicast performance. Are we going to be satisfied with 5% packet loss, or is 1% required? Does it depend on the application? And what's the uh, latency requirement for delivery of multicast packets? Uh, next slide, please. Oh, question? Uh, yes, real quick, in, in the slide before that, somewhere else, you had at the bottom some question that I think Joel, uh, I think the one before, Joel asked about uh, what should the ITF do? Um, yeah. You just glossed over that. It, it would be really nice if part of the output of the document, maybe not necessarily in the document, but part of that output from the working group is, you know, some recommendation. Is there another work item or something that we should be looking at? Right. Either in MLD or PIM or somewhere else. Um, that, that would be very nice. Besides just, because I saw the section in there that says, you know, there's some items for discussion. Besides just putting it there, it would be nice for us to take it somewhere for it to be done. It may be here, but you know, somewhere. Well, I think this is a, a really great group for us to learn those things. And uh, it, it, I don't want to position myself as, uh, you know, the, in any way, major authority on multicast. I know something a lot about AV2 wireless and so on. But uh, the multicast problems, this this group will, will contribute to make this uh, an effective document. Thanks. I guess that's it. Oh, uh, so oh, uh, let me just mention more, one more thing. So th there were some comments from Joel that I responded to on the list and did not incorporate the text for those comments and resolutions in the draft. I was waiting to see if there would be more commentary. But uh, after this IETF, and also, depending upon any discussion uh, from this uh, presentation, uh, there will be a new revision of this document uh, available within, let's say, two or three weeks. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, please, um, Where's please the blue come sheet? up. Blue sheets over there. OK. Um, so thank you all. That's uh, M. Bondi is concluding. PIM is beginning. Are there not separate blue sheets for PIM? Okay. Please sign the blue sheets. Um, put PIM on there too, maybe? Yeah. I can't remember what we've done today. We've always done separate. Yeah, we okay. Let's yeah. do separate. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, if you go and ask for the blue sheets, we could take one of these. Or do we not have? Not one Wait, does the okay, thank you, and we'll see you all in Montreal, I guess. Yeah, yeah, we need to just get started. I didn't yeah, see yeah, any heading there, but we're just gonna write him on, him on there, too. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's fine. Yeah, there's no reason not to. Nobody left. Yeah, just shows. Both slides on there, or I do. And if you want to, you want to just go? Do you have them go? I have them all up and ready, but <laughs> yeah, they yeah, did. Yeah, this slide, yeah, go. Okay, oh, yeah, I have it all too. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that one's just Thank you guys. Me, but this one, oops. So who's been taking minutes? So are you going to stay? Are you okay to continue? Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll take some notes as well. So we'll combine them. Okay, let's, uh, let's hit it. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So this is the PIM working group. Um, we have a pretty full agenda. Need to ask everyone to be as fast as they can, more or less. Um, note well. Hopefully, you've seen this before. Um, this is the agenda. Um, so we're gonna have. We said twenty minutes for the first presentation. If can get a little bit shorter, that'd be great. Then we said roughly 10 minutes for each of the others, but if you can do it in less than 10, that's good because we don't really have time for all of this. And I guess as quick as possible, we'll just go through this. So this is just the status of current working group documents. 
So we have one document being published in a few days. Uh, Pim Yang uh, got some comments during ISG uh, evaluation, and there are some young doctor comments that need to be addressed. Um, up, uh, multiple upstream requirements. Uh, RID had several comments on that, so waiting for the offers to respond to that. Uh, uh, Jim PMLD Yang um, also got a lot of young doctor comments during the evaluation, so we need the offers to respond to that. PIM explicit tracking isn't moving anywhere, um, but um, the offer is saying that he, he will try to do an update for next ITF. Um, there are we, new uh, separate issues. Yeah, yeah, please please sign the blue sheets. We have to do separate sheets for Apple and the end PIM. Um, the, the, we have a working group draft on DR load balancing that was brought back last ITF. Um, so it went to working group last call and went on to the AD a few years ago. There were lots of comments and no one responded to those comments. And then last ITF, it was presented again uh, with with updates. And the question is, um, I don't know, yeah, what we should do about that draft. There's no presentation today. There's no changes since last ITF. No, oh, they do a lot of balancing. Oh, the first one. Um. Okay. Um, yeah, we don't. I'm not sure. Yeah. Take the list, or I don't know if we do. Yeah. So. Um, okay. So as, um, as as an offer. <laughs> Who cares? Um, I would like to ask you know if it's possible to do a working group last call soon, whether we can do that on the list, or want to ask the, what the chairs think. Okay. Real quick. Who thinks this is ready for a working group last call? The uh, DRLB draft at the top there. Raise your hands if you think it's ready. Even if you're an author, raise your bloody hands. Okay, so we have one person in the room that feels that it's ready. Does anybody think that it's not ready? Okay, and say say why. Uh, security consideration section. Um, um, there was a reference to the an MDA uh, standard. I'm a little confused as to because th there was. I guess there's been some changes in the recommended practices for Yang uh, models. Is that accurate? I'm not really sure. I just the security consideration section seems really thin. I think we're going to get pushed okay. back. Okay. So please, um, please provide comments on the list, and yeah, uh, okay. the offers will try to follow up. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so just really quick about security and Yang. There's a template somewhere. Um, I don't know where it is, but I can Google it somewhere that uh, we agreed with security ADs, that if we put that in there, uh, they're going to be happy. All right. Um, OK, then we have DR improvement draft. No update this meeting. But uh, yes, we need people to please go and read the draft and provide comments. Uh, it's been staying there for a long time now, and we really need people to to help help provide your inputs. Um, let's see. IGMP MLD Yang. Um, let's see. Yes, we made we're waiting for Yang um, for uh, the offers to respond to the Yang daughter comments. Uh, we have MSDP model for Yang. Sorry, Yang model for MSDP. Um, we had a working group last call, and there was hardly any responses. Um, so I guess, I don't know, should we do a new working group last call, or do you think it's not ready, or no one is interested? Um, so I would say, please, um, if you care about Young Model for MSDP at all, please make comments on the mailing list, and we'll try to do a, another last call and see if anyone is responding to that. But we, we need some responses to, to move forward. Uh, Justin Dean, just a suggestion. In our working group, we've had a document that wasn't getting a lot of feedback on in last calls, and we asked for a uh, an area review, and we got a really great one, and it, it facilitated moving it forward. Yeah. All right. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, 
And then we have IGMP MLD snooping. Um, Young model will get a presentation on that uh, this meeting. And then we also have this draft on um, basically how to do, um, um, let's see, um, how to resolve, uh, how to find your PIM neighbor or RPF neighbor if you have an IPv6 next hop and you only have IPv4 PIM neighbors. So that draft hasn't had any changes since last ITF either. Um, the offers, um, believe it's which includes me believe it's 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 in a good condition just want to see if the working group has anything more that should be added to that draft but we haven't got any any feedback so Anna, as an offer i guess i'm wondering is it ready for last call or do what do we do from here <laughs> okay same thing so who thinks that this draft is ready for a working group last call got one hand two hands Anybody feel that it's not ready for a working group last call? Okay. Is there a hand? No. So, okay. So we'll take that to list, of course, but that's kind of a start. Yeah. The main problem is we, we need more input. You know, we need a group to be more active. Uh, it's like a general issue, but all right. Okay. Let's start with the presentations. Brian. So that, yeah, let's see, there it is. Okay, I'm, I'm Brian Adamson. I'm gonna talk about uh, kind of uh, multicast routing from the perspective of the, of the mobile ad hoc networking working group. Okay, next slide. Do I need to try? Uh, it's okay. Yeah, we can try to use this. For, no, we, no, that won't work. Okay, I'll, I'll do it here. Uh, basically, a short outline. Uh, Going to just have one slide that kind of highlights MANA routing protocols because um, this is a PIM working group, so uh, there may not be as much familiarity there. As well as provide some uh, outline of some of the approaches that have been taken to multicast routing in mobile ad networks, and then a little bit on the, the concept of simplified multicast forwarding, for which there is an experimental RFC, and then some ideas moving forward. And really, one of the points of this talk is we've identified that there are definitely some forwarding plane considerations for how you do multicast forwarding and, and, and support what's needed for wireless networking. And I'll talk about that. Next. Um, in, in a nutshell, we uh, originally had a set of experimental RFCs, which consisted of a proactive link state routing protocol called OSR, optimized link state routing as well as a on-demand um, distance vector protocol, AODV. Many people have heard of the first two, and there were also some other uh, techniques that also made experimental RFC. One of those is a source routing protocol called DSR, dynamic source routing, as well as another proactive protocol called TBRPF. Um, where we stand in the working group today is the OSR v2 uh, protocol was uh, captured as a proposed standard in RFC um, 7181. And one of the things that we did in the working group in the past number of years, decade, um, is uh, from those original RF, uh, experimental RFCs, we took a little more of an engineering approach and uh, modularized some of the functions of the protocols using what we termed a building blocks approach. And part of that included NHDP and neighborhood discovery protocol with the idea that that could support different types of routing protocols, as well as a common packet format for signaling, and which is known as the packet DB document. And both of those are supporting proposed standards that OSR v2 uses. Um, in addition to what happened in the MANA working group, there were some other activities and other working groups, there may be some people from here, and I'm less familiar with these, but um, stuff at Ripple, and there's all out of the uh, lossy low power, uh, Role working group. And then uh, there's another effort called Babel, which is, is also its own, own working group. And finally, actually, the OSPF working group uh, documented some MANA extensions to OSPF. And I think there are three experimental RFCs that basically describe three different candidates for extending OSPF to work in a more mesh networking type environment. Next. Um, 
multicast routing is challenging. Actually, Charlie talked to a lot of the <laughs> issues, so I won't dwell on those. Um, another uh, subtle issue is, is that because I may receive uh, a packet from someone I can hear over here, but need to forward to a person I hear over here, I may be actually receiving and forwarding a packet out the same wireless interface, which makes reverse uh, path forwarding checks uh, more complicated. And um, also the, the topologies can be really dynamic. So even if you could do uh, some reverse uh, path forwarding check, sometimes uh, you might be better served to treat multicast a little differently because those, those checks may not always be valid. Um, there were some uh, concepts for multicasts that were been proposed both in some academic papers um, as well as some old draft uh, internet drafts. Some of these were tethered to the unicast protocols that I described, like there's a multicast AODV uh, draft that was proposed quite a few years ago, as well as a multicast OSR protocol. And then there was a, a different approach called ODMRP, on-demand multicast routing protocol. And then actually the OSR.org implementation of the OSR protocol actually had a mechanism called uh, basic multicast forwarding it was not a standalone IP packet forwarding mechanism, but rather an API that an application could register with to submit packets that got um, flooded over the same uh, backbone that the routing protocol messages got flooded over. So it's sort of like an LSA, uh, opaque LSA thing. Where the MANA working group actually landed is we actually have an experimental RFC entitled Simplified Multicast Forwarding, and the next slide talks about that. Um, basically, we don't do anything group specific in SMF. We flood multicast packets within a MANA routing area. And just like that um, uh, basic multicast forwarding that OSR did, it uses the same, um, it, it can use the same efficient flooding techniques that are used to help more efficiently disseminate link state information for uh, like a protocol like OSR. Um, except uh, we differentiated because you may want to have different metrics by which you do data flooding versus control plane flooding. And actually there are a number of different relay set algorithms that can be used. And what's interesting about the relay set al algorithms is that they actually use neighborhood information only. They don't require any kind of global topology to make, uh, to select a backbone. The way they do that is Basically, you get from your one hop neighbors, you learn kind of what the two hop neighborhood is. And there are actually uh, a number of different algorithms for calculating and selecting relays that guarantee that you're going to reach everybody in a um, domain. And that, that the term is used connecting dominating set because that's basically the subset of nodes in the graph that can reach everybody else from one hop away. Um, in addition to these basic algorithms uh, ourselves, we've done work looking at some different um, enhancements to the algorithms using uh, metrics to help overcome uh, the lossy uh, characteristic of some of the um, layer two protocols that we deal with, particularly when it comes to multicast. Um, for example, maybe selecting extra relays beyond that minimum connected dominating set to provide an additional redundancy in uh, transmission to help overcome some of the packet loss that happens. Another little uh, issue is the algorithms kind of are designed to say optimize a current snapshot of topology, but in a mesh network where things are moving dynamically, sometimes it's better to maybe stick with more of a suboptimum um, relay set in the interest of stability for your, your data flows as opposed to always causing the uh, set of relays to flap around quite uh, rapidly. And so these are some enhancements to those relay set algorithms that have been explored. None of those are yet captured in any RFCs, but there are some academic papers out there on it. Next. A uh, couple implementations. I already mentioned the OSR D basic multicast forwarding. We actually at NRL have an open source implementation called NRL SMF, which um, is a cross platform uh, user space forwarding daemon. Um, we mostly use it for. Um, simplified multicast forwarding, but it can be used for other purposes too. Uh, in addition to doing classic flooding, which is uh, what we also talk called dumb flooding, where everybody floods each packet, it um, can be controlled by either an NHDP daemon, um, such as our OSR protocol to do relay set selection, or we've also integrated it with the Quagga OSPF 
with man a extensions to do re relay set selection for uh, for more efficient flooding. Um, in SMF, it does the duplicate packet detection, which the next slide I think talks about. Again, oh, actually, first this uh, where where it stands in the world as a user space routing uh, daemon or forwarding daemon. It actually uses uh, various mechanisms in your PCAP packet catcher interface devices or um, virtual TunTap type interfaces to basically capture or intercept packets coming into the operating system and uh, you know from possibly a radio and then. We have an API to interface with the, the routing daemon to control the relay set selection. Um, one of the things that we've been doing, and this is what I'm kind of want to get to the end of the talk here, is really talk about we've been exploring now, how do we construct a forwarding information base that can support the needs of uh, simplified multicast flooding as well as um, possible multicast routing mechanisms that are group specific that we maybe layer on top of the SMF flooding. Next slide. Uh, and that's kind of what this slide talks to. We actually, uh, in the Man A working group, had a couple drafts that were presented a, a couple years ago, and they're both expired. One was on an enhancement to that OODMRP protocol that also included support for asymmetries, where I may have a link that's a broadcast uh, transmit only interface, where I may have other interfaces that I'm receiving on, so I have non reciprocal um, connectivity. And this document describes techniques for. Constructing a no problem multicast uh, routing tree or mesh. It's more of a mesh than a tree over topologies with those non-reciprocal links. Also, we've had a proposal for a concept called elastic multicast, which is more of a flow-based multicast routing protocol. It starts with the same flooding mesh that SMF uses, whether it's classical flooding or one that uses the efficient flooding via relay sets, and then it actually uses acknowledgments from downstream nodes, i.e. nodes that have joined groups or, have, or who have downstream neighbors who have joined groups to keep a higher rate of multicast forwarding um, active for, from a specific source. So when we say flow, it's really like a five tuple description. Typically, you would join a group, which would be a star uh, G or, or even a, a source SSM group, and then that would basically detect packets that were flooded at a low rate and reactivate them for higher rate flooding, like a say an IPTV flow or something like that. So that only high rate flooding occurs for flows that there are actually people in the wireless network interested in and would only go to the parts of the network where there is actually interest in that. Um, in addition to um, using the actual low rate flooding of packets to sort of advertise or announce flows, we've also have a proposal to have an advertisement message, which is kind of like a route request for a multicast group, more similar to ODMRP, you basically announce a packet describing a, a flow, a source group tuple, for example, and then downstream nodes would acknowledge that to then start activating forwarding of the flow through a, a subset of the SMF mesh. What I point out too, that that can actually be used to support gateways to FEM routers because you could have a basically a gateway device use that advertisement message to advertise its presence to the, to the uh, man -A mesh. Uh, next slide, keep things going forward. Um, again, the main um, thing that we, we use to enable safe flooding in a network is duplicate packet detection. And that's one of the main aspects of the simplified multicast forwarding RFC is to describe the semantics for how you do duplicate packet detection for IPv4 and IPv6 traffic. Um, essentially, in our NRL SMF implementation, to do duplicate packet detection, we already keep a state on a kind of a per flow basis to help reduce uh, false duplicates. Uh, we, the specification describes a combination of hash based or and or identify, identifier based uh, duplicate packet detection. And for V6, it even specifies a header extension that can be used to apply a specific unique identifier to IPv6 packets. Um, we keep a limited history of, or a window of, of duplicate packet detection for flow. It's configurable in our implementation. And then because we already had that, building a concept like Elastic Multicast on top of the SMF forwarding engine was relatively straightforward. It has some additional 
things you need to detect when you flows because now you're actually concerned about group information, whereas enough didn't really care about that. I also point out that in addition to multicast protocols, on-demand protocols like EOD, you kind of have a similar need. It's not often easy to deploy an AODV protocol on um, existing internet protocol hosts because of this concept of on-demand routing. You kind of need to know when a, when a um, packet for a specific source destination comes into play so that route requests can be activated. Uh, there's probably similar impl implementations to what we've done to, with SMF for that, but the idea would be if we do build a forwarding information base that's sort of a man-a multicast, it could also possibly have some support for similar concepts for unicast routing as well. Next slide. Um, as an example, when looking at that in our own implementation, for inspiration, we went and looked at the Zorp source code. And basically, that's the data structure in the MRoute-D header file. Uh, next slide kind of shows possibly places where we would add additional state variables to keep track of things like duplicate packet detection and other stuff, depending on what the protocol needs, like Elastic Multicast does a little more packet counting for flows and that kind of thing to decide when to trigger those acknowledgement messages that I described. Next slide. Um, basically a mirror of that MRoute-D is we had the basic, uh, in our in our SMF implementation, uh, a concept we called interface associations, where basically when a packet came in an inbound interface, you maintain both duplicate packet detection state as well as the um, type of flooding algorithm that was being used on a uh, pairwise interface association basis. Next slide. And we augmented that for our protocol like Elastic Multicast by simply extending that and adding more uh, state variables to this. And I, this is kind of, this isn't showing you the details of it, but this is where at least we're actively looking at how can we build a forwarding information base for man -A multicast that can be applied in a general way, both to support things like Elastic Multicast that we're working on now, as well as potentially other protocols moving forward. Next slide. Uh, we can kind of skip this one in the interest of time. Conclusion, um, just in a summary, we think that uh, mobile ad hoc networking multicast has some additional considerations uh, as compared to more conventional wireline multicast protocols. And we think that there's a potential for some type of common FIB and, and con supporting control plane interface to support these protocols. Um, I think the MANA working group is, was, and Justin's the MANA chair, can talk to that a little better than I, chartered to develop the FIB, but um, moving forward with MANA, I think the idea is maybe to talk to other working groups to see if there's some common goals that, that people have interest in. Uh, Justin Dean, chair of the MANA working group. Uh, we brought this presentation here because uh, this is something we're chartered to do, is to work on affording information base for MANA. Um, the MANA working group has had less and less participation, so we're looking for more people to participate, and we think it has a larger kind of a, can have a larger impact than just MANA, because we, like, we have up there Babel and Roll, and they all have um, the possibility of doing multicast in these wireless networks, and we wanted to make a way that there's a simple interface that they can all kind of talk down to to control the multicasts that could be disseminated, so you could end up with different um, capabilities for different purposes for multicast. And we, we thought PIM might be the right place to do this work instead of in just the MANA so that it gets uh, put out to the, the wider community. Um, so with that being said, we are looking for, for people who may be interested in working on this and input from this group and others. Um, that's all I have to say there. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so this is the right group. Thank you for coming. Um, as far as discussing discussing this on the email list, do you think it would be practical to do it on your list and our list? Or do you want to have a separate list just among certain participants? Yeah, um, I think that would be useful to do it on both. Um, we are going to have a talk, uh, me and my co-chair and Alvaro, about where Manet is heading later this week. So we'll have a better understanding of what um, of where we're going to go after that. Yeah, but yes, I, I think we should have it within the PIM group. I would second the idea of having on both lists because you'll kept, maybe capture some new subscribers and that kind of thing. Yeah, to, true. You know, that aren't on both lists. Charlie? Um, I'm Charlie Perkins. 
Um, so SMF was really developed in response to the need for a um, efficient flooding protocol. Yeah. And so it really tries to include the whole network right. across a uh, connected dominating set. So this is exactly what's needed. Uh, as you mentioned, it's tough to deal with uh, relay points that are mobile and breaking their neighborhoods up and so on. But I just was wondering how appropriate is it uh, for actual multicast groups that may the membership may only be a small percentage of the total number of devices in the network? Right. So that's uh, exactly part of the motivation for something like Elastic Multicast, which prunes down that flooding mesh to just the subset of relays um, needed to uh, service those sparse members. Um, we've even done a little bit of uh, unicast support of, of the Elastic uh, Multicast uh, idea. Uh, right now, we have an experimental implementation of it. Um, I think it's possible, you know, when we've done an internet draft before that describes very high level the acting mechanism. Um, we, I think it's there's there's a better document that could be written if we got people interested in, in, the, in the working groups in doing that. And we also have some ongoing research where we're looking at um, in those acknowledgement messages embedding. Um, we have an idea of a confidence and a quality coefficients to help maybe more intelligently decide if we need to have some redundancy in the relays to uh, cover. Uh, Provide a lot, you know, more reliable multicast forwarding within a very lossy wireless area, and potentially even uh, to use that information to construct network coding forwarding strategies within it, which is not something that's ready for prime time here. But those are kind of the forward things well, that we're the, investigating. What's the motivation for the term elastic? I mean, somehow. So, so yeah. The, yeah, it was just a term picked because the idea is you start with a mesh, and then it has it like kind of like a rubber band. The, the acknowledgments kind of expand and contract the, the, that flooding mesh. It's not really a tree because it's really built on top of the relay set mesh of flooding that you have. So okay. it's, it's more of a, a pretty sounding phrase than a really logical. <laughs> <laughs> so as working group chair of the MNA group, Justin Dean again, I think uh, Elastic Multicast is a driver for the work that would be being done in the FIB. You would want the FIB to support something like Elastic Multicast, but Elastic Multicast isn't the only thing that would use it. Yeah, for example, like um, Moody Marquee that we're part of. Right, so, so depending so, on your deployment, if it is more static, you might want to use something different to control the FIB. But I think the, the main point is that we, we get the FIB right for wireless multicast so that you can control what's being flooded where by different algorithms. Elastic Multicast being the one that are, is driving us right now but there would be others as well. We want to capture that. Uh, we don't want to work so that it's, we, we have a standalone protocol and it, it does what it does and nothing else would work with it. We think that there's more value in building up uh, an engineering solution so that other protocols could use a fit. Jay Collin, um, just for clarification, uh, Mike, you're saying, uh, are, are is this a suggestion to recharter the group to support the needs? Okay, so it's more a suggestion to figure out how to express these needs within PIM. Is that the idea? The idea is to support MNA with multicast expertise as they develop the FIB. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, MNA currently is chartered to do this work. So. Um, and we're looking for more participation and, and interest from people who know multicast. Uh, any further questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we need to move on here. Okay, I will give a, a quick introduction uh, for the IGMP snooping young model. Uh, from the last uh, uh, ITAP meeting, we have an uh, update uh, for the uh, draft uh, for two, two things. And the first one, let's select. Okay. 
The first thing is that mm -hmm. uh, we make the admin snooping into instance um, under the uh, bridge view and the VLAN view, and uh, also under the L2VPN view. And uh, we uh, delete deleted from the uh, uh, interface reference. And uh, also the second thing is that, next slide. Uh, we augmented the interface model uh, to uh, convey the IDMP uh, and MRE snooping and uh, also the statistics, statistics of the uh, protocol. And the next slide. That's all. And uh, next. And we, we, are, we think the young model had been uh, stable and uh, uh, ready for the young doctor's review. And uh, so we can ready for the working group last call. Jay Collin, the uh, security considerations document on this one, I think also does not uh, follow the, the recommended template yet for Yang. So uh, maybe update that and then Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Yisong. Okay, so now we have six individual uh, drafts being presented to us. We cut. We didn't. We didn't have several uh, PIM drafts presented this time, just for the sake of time. Um, so, um, Zay Chen, am I saying your name right? Um, you're up next. Yep. Very good. And this may be blasphemy, but um, we're probably going to go over the noon cutoff time. So. Feel, at that time, feel free to leave, but we may just keep going and it's going to be recorded. So, um, yeah, but please, uh, yeah, but, uh, but be brief. try to be quick. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah, fine. So <laughs> that's try fine. to finish close to That's me. fine. Yeah. And we can keep on go, going with the notes if you guys need okay. to go. Um, go. Get it. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jochen from Huawei. And uh, the author, Meng Rui, cannot come to London for some reason, so I am going to present this slide. And this is a very initial work on um, PIMC, PIMSM protocol, uh, just uh, submitted uh, after the Singapore meeting. And uh, this is the problem description as defined in current standards. Join messages are multicast packets, and uh, the Destination address of these packets are well known multicast address called all PIM routers. And the TTL of the packet should be set to one. And a PIM router would compare unicast upstream neighbor address carried in the message with the address to itself. If the, these two addresses are same, uh, the message will be processed. So the problem is, as long as there are one router in the network cannot support PIM, and uh, the join message will be discarded, as shown in the uh, example below. If the router X does not support PIM SM, the join message from DR3 and the DR4 will be discarded. So next step. Next step. Hey, this is the big picture of the solution. Uh, the core idea of the solution is to put an unicast IP address into the join message. Uh, uh, the, the unicast address is the uh, address of the uh, RP point or the source. And uh, the routers in the network could be PIM routers or legacy IP routers. Uh, for PIM routers, uh, it just uh, involves uh, an SAL policy or similar like that to capture the join message and process it. For legacy IP uh, uh, routers, uh, they just forward the join message based on the uh, destination address. Next slide. And these are some details. A uh, neighbor relationship between PIM routers will no longer be maintained, and the join point messages will no longer be multicast with TTR1. Uh, they will be unicast as below. Uh, the destination 
address of the join point message should be the RP address or the address of the source. Uh, the source address of the join point message should be the address of the join or point router. Next slide. Uh, this is the uh, processing of the join messages. Uh, join messages could be received by PIM routers through ACL or similar means. They could also be received by the destination of the messages. Next slide. And uh, there is one uh, change to the packet format. Uh, if a SPT is being joined or point, mm -hmm. there will be no joined point source address field in the message, and the number of joined source in the message is one. Next slide. Uh, so because this is a very initial work, we need more reviews and comments, that's all. Hi, Jay Collins. Um, do you see any advantage in this over establishing a GRE tunnel and making a PIM session over that? You mean the reverse tunnel for data packing? I mean that this this work proposes to sort of establish an ACL-based relationship between yeah. two PIM routers that are not directly connected. So if you're doing this, why not set up a GRE tunnel instead and uh, just run the PIM without yeah, modification? Uh, but you should uh, create configure the tunnel, right? But now it's just sending a, a message with a unicast address. You have to configure the network with mm -hmm. many tunnels. Right. So that yeah. same would be true for ACL, right? Uh, yeah, we are going to avoid to, uh, so many configurations. Um, okay. Maybe some automatic, automated tunneling so you don't have to configure the tunnels could be useful. Uh, from Cisco. So my question is, uh, do you have this unicast packet only for RP or even it is for SSM case? Uh, sorry? So in case of SSM join where okay. uh, you are directly joined to the source, yeah. So you are going to do the same mechanism till yeah. source, or it's only for the RP? Uh, yeah, that's, that's the same uh, mechanism. Okay. Hey, I is from Cisco. I've got two questions. So, about sending the join, how do R2 or R1 know the address of the RP? I guess they can know. X is not PIM capable, but how do you determine what the next PIM router is you want to send your join to? Yeah. How do you do that? Uh, currently, we, we haven't considered this. <laughs> okay. And <clears throat> when the RP sends the multicast packet to R1 and R2, I assume it's sent as unicast or it's tunnels? Yeah, they are unicast tunnels. Okay, so you convert the multicast on the RP to unicast, and then it's received by R1 as unicast. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I can't answer. The maybe if you maybe details can came back to the author better. and send you an email. Okay. 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 Yeah, so um, please uh, send comments on the mailing list and uh, we can discuss it there in more detail. That's good. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so what's the Greg, Greg Mursky. Yeah. I don't have the agenda in front of me. It's a PDF on my phone. The BFD. The BFD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you got it. Mm -hmm. Ask to present the list. Yeah, that's right. Okay. okay. Um so um we're presenting um use of uh BFD for multi point networks or for short uh, point to multi point BFD. Uh, in the case of um, PMSM uh, on a shared uh, segment. Okay. So, um, as uh, discussed, that, that proposed that to have a, a designated router which takes the special uh, role responsibility of the, for directly attached hosts 
uh, that the only DR for uh, sends the join and uh, the other routers they just listen um, their problem in, in this situation would be is that if uh, something happens to DR uh, then uh, the other router which is capable of taking on DR uh, role will find it out in uh, by default in 105 seconds so even if we will uh, change that default setting to the minimum so that uh, hello packets to be sent every second, then it still will be uh, single digit seconds, which is significant impact on the services that uh, are running over the multicast infrastructure. Um, so what we're proposing is uh, that um, the DR uh, to use um, point to multipoint BFD and become a root of uh, point to multipoint BFD and other nodes on the same shared segment, uh, PMSM nodes, to be leaves and listen to that. So that will allow uh, other nodes to detect their uh, problem with the DR in sub-second interval. And because uh, PIM, uh, point to multipoint BFD uses uh, demand mode, uh, so it's a unicast distribution. So the leaves don't send messages to the root. So thus, it's very nice fit uh, with this scenario. Next. Ah, OK. Yes. Hey, Greg. Um, one of the reasons no, for you those. You need to announce yourself. Hey, Andrew Dolgan on Nokia. Um, one of the reasons for those timers to be what they are is uh, for the network to converge. Uh, have you tried? doing this in a real network and, and see what instability you're going to cause and because that continuously is an issue like there's a lot of state it may look nicely on for for a, on a slide with four routers but if you have multiple routers and you start seeing failures and if you start re-establishing the tree too fast you're going to have instability in a network um well actually um when Very we, bad things happen. Yeah, when we work on this uh, proposal, we had the, in consideration uh, the other proposal that's uh, already a working group document. It's a DR improvement that suggests to have a BDR. So the BDR already has a state. It just doesn't act on it. So the BDR can detect the DR result and then take immediately the role of DR. But again, um, if we look at only this scenario that we have only two routers on a segment, then some will say, okay, why do you use point to multi point BFD when uh, point to point uh, will surface? Uh, first, point to point is bi directional, and DR is not really interested in the state of BDR. So that will be an overhead. At the same time, and point to multi point will definitely work for the case of two. And another is that. Uh, well, we can imagine the situation when you have more than two uh, PMSM nodes on a shared segment, and then again, uh, point to multi point BFD works seamlessly there. Andrew Logan again. Uh, I have maybe it's a philosophical comment, but uh, you know, PIM is great when it's left alone the way it was intended to work. And if we're gonna try to make a Fiat into Ferrari, uh, that's um, not gonna, that Fiat will fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that even Pig will fly with uh, enough thrust, um, but it will probably fall apart uh, in the process. Um, Again, um, this is a proposal. It's that um, open uh, for the discussion. We appreciate the comments and thank you for your insight. Um, if um, it seems that uh, sub-second uh, detection is too fast, again, uh, nothing precludes to make it slower, but still faster than 105 uh, seconds. Again use of BFD does not mandate how fast you detect. It only tells us that there is a way of being more flexible than existing control plane detection. 
absolutely agree. I've seen network that 105 was not was too fast. That's why I'm worried about uh, going um, going to much because the the whole thing is if we if we want to have a solution for a faster convergence of Redis and and we're gonna I'm more than open to uh, to having it, but then we have to make it really well defined in a scope of what's the scope, what's the size, what are the things, before somebody takes a year from now a draft that may, may become an RFC, reads through it, and expect that to work in, in the real uh, world in a, you know, infinite scale of the network. So that, that's my concern. I'm not saying that this cannot be done, mm -hmm. Uh, everything can be done, as you as you notice, but everything has its, uh, you know, scale and and an environment it can be deployed. Yeah. Okay. Right, but again, uh, what I wanted to um, reiterate is that uh, we put the scope on this proposal only for the shared uh, segments. So it's not that we are uh, envisioning or suggesting to use. Uh, Point to multi point BFD from RP throughout the domain. But I appreciate the input and let's keep this discussion going uh, on the list. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah, so, just, uh, what's, sorry, can I just make one comment too as yeah. a participant? Um, yeah, so there are several implementations doing BFD with PIM today, mm -hmm. but they do like, I think typically like a full mesh shell be all BFD peerings. So this would be more scalable than that, yeah, right? Thank you. Yeah. And we have a Yang model draft for PIM that also actually has uh, some BFD parameters in the Yang model. Um, because yeah, there are several implementations doing this, and maybe yeah, it could be helpful actually, if you look yeah, at that. Yeah, actually, with, with, uh, it's a very good point uh, because I participate in BFD Yang model, but BFD Yang model does not include point to multi point because we are finalizing. Uh, base uh, point to multi point BFD specification and once it's done then we can go back to the yang model and see uh how we need to uh uh adjust yeah yeah by the way sorry i think we maybe mo remove the bft parts of the pim model because it's in a bft mm -hmm. specific yeah. model but yeah that's what no, we sorry. suggested yeah, to yeah. protocols yeah, is right. that use mount of bfd yeah. Okay, uh, so what we're proposing, uh, we're proposing not only uh, to use uh, point to multi point BFD in this uh, scenario, but we uh, propose to have an optional uh, TLV in a hello packet to use uh, DR to bootstrap uh, their um, session. Uh, difference between point to multi point BFD and the regular BFD that there is no uh, three way handshake uh, process. So, thus, uh, there needs to be a sum out of uh, band, or uh, whether it's a control plane or management plane, that will uh, inform leaves of the discriminator that uh, the root is using. So that's what we're uh, proposing uh, this optional TLV for that to be included in a um, hello message. So the DR will advertise the discriminator that being assigned to this point-to-multi-point uh, uh, BFD session. And uh, then um, when it's a root, it, it should use the same IP address as a source IP address as uh, it uses in uh, PM hello, PMSM hello message. So can we go? Yeah. So that's a, a very simple extension. Uh, it needs to have uh, type, length, and my discriminator. My discriminator is a 32-bit long uh, unsigned. So that's, that's it. And uh, I appreciate comments. And thank you, Andrew. And uh, I think that uh we can have one more comment or just take it to the list okay one more comment if there is one yeah all right we'll um discuss the list mm -hmm. i think Perfect. i'll have some comments Thank myself too Thank so. thanks i think i'm next then. okay uh, i think i should stand up there because it's yeah. that's the video oh, for your slides Thank <laughs> you.
Uh, yeah. All right. So um, just brought this draft uh, a few weeks ago of, uh, about restored bits in PIM. Uh, so I was discussing with Alvaro when we did, um, he was reviewing some other PIM documents, and we realized that there are some minor issues. Next slide, please. So it turns out that several PIM message types are using restored bits from the common PIM header, but they don't update the, the base PIM RFC, and there's nothing really saying whether those bits are supposed to be per message type or if, if they're kind of like common for all PIM messages. So one thing this draft does is basically point out that each message type is free to use the, the restored bits in its own way. And that's already being done where PIM Bider, for instance, is using uh, four of the bits to indicate um, uh, what, ki what kind of DF messages they're sending. While the same, some of the same bit positions, so one of the same bit positions is used for no forward in BSR. So there is already precedence for this. So also by using the bits per message type, we basically can do more with those bits that we have. The other thing the draft proposes is how to extend the PIM message space because we only have 16 message types and we already have used 14 of them or 13 of them. Uh, next slide, please. So what it's proposing is that we use type 15 to extend the space. And similar to what was done with DF messages for Bider, it basically says we can use some of the bits, like four of the bits, four of the bits, four of the restored bits as a subtype. So basically that means that we can have 16 additional messages. So existing implementations, they would just see type 15 and they would ignore it. If you support any of the new message types, you would have to implement type 15 and, and know how to look into the subtype field for additional type specification. Uh, one thing we could consider is we could maybe make the, make it wider. If you think we might run out of those 16 additional types, maybe we could use one of the restored bits and actually have up to 256 possible types. What it means, though, is that any few messages that are using those types would have to maybe include their own restored field or something if they want to have some additional restored bits for, for the specific type. Next slide, please. I don't think there is. OK. Yeah, so basically the question is, do you think it's, it's worth extending the type space? Is it done in a useful way? And uh, hopefully you agree that it's good to document how we use these restored bits and it also, by the way, defines uh, not IANA registry showing which bits are used by which messages for which purpose. So, uh, don't question. I'm Charlie Perkins uh, from uh, Future Way. But can I look at? Can you show the last slide again? Yeah. So, if you want to get a lot more subtypes, you can make types 13, 14, and and 15 all use that subtype field. Then you get 48 more. Yeah. That'll do for a while. Right. Yeah, actually, if, if you guys like this idea, um, then there's no reason not to do that. Uh, I agree. Uh, it, it, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So currently, we have no no new drafts. You know, requesting a new type at least not working group drafts. But there's a couple of things in this meeting and and you know potential future ideas. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I guess. Ask for comments on the list. Yeah, yeah. Please read the drafts and provide comments. And, um, and yeah, this might help us, you know, be able to do more future work if we need more such types. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, Jing Rang, you up. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jing Rong from Huawei, China. Uh, mm -hmm. I need this piece of paper to help me express. Uh, that was the beer extension. That's right. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to do a vote. How many people in this room uh, know about beer? Please raise your hand. Oh, about uh, uh, 15. Huh. OK, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, before uh, this draft is in fact a protocol draft to support a 
uh, scenario draft that I just read, read in beer. Uh, before I before the introduction uh, of the peer extension, I want to introduce some background about beer. Uh, beer is an alternative multicast by using a multicast specific beer header. Uh, it is defined in two RFC. The first line for RFC. Considering the tr transition from NGM VPN to beer, I have been raising a draft to run beer on a multicast tree. Uh, so one of the multicast tree is built by PIM. This is what this draft want to do to build a multicast tree with some beer related information to support forwarding many multicast flow using a single tree while not wasting any link bandwidth. That is to say, multicast is always replicated on demand. So this is the combination of two parts. The first part is a multicast specific encapsulation we call the beer header. And the second part is a multicast specific label we call the beer label. And the second part is the well known PIM protocol, which is a multicast specific protocol. So, next page, please. Uh, that's right. uh, in this picture, we build one tree, one tree. A is the root of the tree. D, E, and F are the three leaves of the tree. Now, PIM need to build the tree. It seems to be easy, right? PIM build a tree, easy, right? So, then the date plan for wedding began. When A receive a packet, it impose a beer header to the packet with a bit string 0101 to tell every node in the network who received this packet that it wants to go to D and E. So D and E will get the packet, uh, but F will never get this packet because the bit string is 0, 1, 0, 1. So this is the tray based beer. It is a tray with beer information to support the forwarding procedure. Then how can we build a tray with beer information? Come to the next page. One question here. So, uh, sorry, uh, maybe uh, listening English oh. is hard for me. So, I want to present the whole slide. Uh, can you ask a question after that? Actually, why don't you? Thank you. Why don't you? Why don't you go ahead and answer the question right now? Um, <laughs> but he's not going to probably be able to answer it because he may not be able to understand you. Okay. So, my question was: Is it complete beer domain, or it is a hybrid of PIM and beer, or it's complete PIM? So picture which you're showing. Okay, it's a beer domain, while at the same time it is a PIM domain. We can say it is a single, uh, like a single IGP area. Mm. So the next page we will introduce. We will we will build the tree with beer information. Uh, the principle. The principle. It's uh, when a downstream down node send a PIM join to its upstream node, it includes an extra join attribute, which we call beer join attribute. It includes a subfield called FBM for wedding, for wedding bit mask. For example, when D send to C, a PIM join, it includes a FBM of 0001, and C send to B, 
with a forwarding bit mask, 0, 0, 1, 1, and B, send to A with a bit string, 0, 1, 1, 1. So this is the main principle of the PIM extension. And a join attribute called B join attribute. Come to the next page. Okay, hold on so just a second. Okay. This is the peer join oh, attribute. Hey, Jing Rong, just hold on just a second. Uh, who member is calling Nokia? Just again to understand this, uh, to this slide, are you, are you trying to say that both peer and PIM are signaled at the same time throughout the network? Is this like PIM over beer or vice versa, or there are two separate trees? Okay, it's a combination of PIM and beer, in fact, combination. Okay. So in the first slide, I have said it is a combination of three parts. PIM is a multicast specific protocol. Beer is a multicast specific encapsulation. One is the protocol in control plan, and one is the encapsulation in data plan. We combine these two. So basically, PIM will override, will, will write beer. That's basically, PIM will go over beer. Is, is that what you're saying, right? PIM, uh, uh, pardon? Yeah. Andrew Logan, I, it's okay. I actually read it. Um, it looks to me like a PIM signaling of beer. Instead of putting apart the draft, I would highly recommend you read use cases for beer. You, you, you use, you read architecture for beer. You understand why beer came to life and then come to a conclusion about your draft. Yeah. We, you, Want a use case or scenario later? Yeah, so we, we, we need to move on. And he's going to be presenting this in beer as well, and you guys can have at it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but the basic idea, he's here because he's proposing extensions to PIM to allow you to build beer forwarding trees in the data plane. So. Um, let's let him continue and we got to get going. Yeah, just maybe two more minutes. Two more minutes. Yeah, quick. Yeah. Okay. Uh, come on, this. Oh, this is the beer joint attribute. And uh, the next page is a uh, hello team, hello option extension for beer. Uh, skip. Next page. Okay. So, so that's it. Uh, an extension to beer to build a, a tree with beer information. Remember that the most important is the beer join attribute, which includes an FBM when PIM join messages are sent hope by hope toward the root of the tree. Uh, and um, one more thing the scenario draft will be presented uh, tomorrow afternoon. That is the use case or scenario draft. This draft is, uh, is in fact a protocol draft which support that use case or support that scenario we called, uh, I have introduced. Uh, we <clears throat> I am focusing on a, a transition, be a transition from traditional NGMVPN. So PIM is uh, one of the okay. protocol used in traditional NGMVPN. So this is the scenario. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good. And now. Mankamana. So, Mankamana Mishra from Cisco Systems. So, I'm presenting this for one of my colleagues. He couldn't come here uh, to present this. 
Oh, next slide. Yeah. We have only few slides. So what wh what was the motivation behind this draft was the PIM uh, non-register packet. So today we I think we send it uh, individual packet per source. And there were a couple of customers who were <coughs> having complain about uh, policing is dropping the packet at the RP because of there were multiple source active in their network. And there are uh, many more uh, protocols. They already are doing, uh, basically they are going to, they are uh, packaging multiple packets together and sending it. So that's exactly what we are proposing here in this draft that multiple null, null register can be packed in single register and send it to RP. Yeah. And it's just, it's very small draft. And there are a couple of factors which we have taken care of because uh, we, one of the most difficult part was that how you are going to say that which all null register packet, uh, packets need to be merged together. So it could be timer based because even if let's say your uh, packets are going every 60 seconds but if we are going to merge a couple of them and some of them are reaching within 40 seconds so uh, it might not matter much so we would request you to give a comment and review this draft yes one more slide there yeah so the advantage <coughs> is basically in the network we are reducing the register packets and better control plan utilizes. No, I don't think so. But they asked me to resolve that view. Is there anything that we need to ask at the working group? Uh, this, uh, this is just it. Yeah, yeah just, I guess, uh, yeah, please. Um, Please read, read I mean, if you don't have any comments now, please read the draft and provide comments on the mailing list. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll do the last one. Um, Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I need your help. With this. Okay, last presentation right here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so this is about reliable PIM registers. It was a proposal that was actually presented here maybe a couple of years ago. And there is some new interest in, in, interest in looking at this now. Um, actually, it's some of the, the reasons to look into this is the same as the, the previous draft. Um, normally, with PIM registers, you have to do soft state. You send registers every 60 seconds. If you have thousands of SCMGs, it's like thousands of messages. And if one if one or a few of those get dropped, you still end up doing data registers, which just makes things even worse. So the idea with both the previous draft and this is to come up with some solution for this. Uh, what's special about this is to make it reliable and basically make registers hard state. Next slide, please. So um, some of the motivation why this kind of came back now is one thing is we're talking about um, deprecating MSDP for inter-domain use. The only other use for MSDP really is uh, any cost RP. Um, but um, and we also have a PIM PIM based uh, any cost RP solution. The problem with the PIM based one is that it's soft state again. MSDP is kind of nice in some way because it uses TCP, so it's hard state. So some of the, the idea here is, um, do we really need MSTP? Perhaps we can do reliable registers over TCP with PIM instead. We already have PIM port, which is reliably sending joint print messages uh, over TCP. And maybe we can extend that to also send register messages. And um, let's see, uh, probably next slide. So yeah, I kind of said this already today. Um, you send it in, today we have to send individual messages for every S comma G, and then you have to send a register stop to act that. And you're, you're in trouble if you start using some of those messages. One solution could maybe be the previous draft, is to pack multiple registers together. Um, another solution is what I'm presenting now, which is to make this hard state. So we only send a single, 
single register message when the source becomes active and you just send a sim single withdrawal or whatever when the, the source goes away. So there's no periodic state anymore. Um, let's see, next slide. Um, let's move on. Um, yeah, so the idea is to extend PIM port uh, to, to send registers. Um, next slide. Um, so one issue is that PIM port uses hellos to negotiate that you support the mechanism and so on. So this draft has some talk about how to do that between first talk and RP. But next slide. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, so this is what I just said about you announced the initial source and then you withdraw it and it becomes inactive. Next slide. Um, so this could be used for registers between the first up and RP, but also between RPs and then any cost RP set. So one thing is uh, MSCP has some policies for how to do like a mesh group and what sources to announce and stuff like that. Uh, if you want to use something like this for that, you may have to add some policies and stuff also to this mechanism. Next slide. Um, yeah, so you only need support really on RP and first hop routers, uh, which means all first hop routers that you, well, you, you don't necessarily need this on all first hop routers, but at least to take advantage of it, obviously the first hop router needs to support it plus the RP that it's speaking to. Next slide. Um, uh, next slide. Okay, so basically, uh, if you would like input on, on this, please read the draft, let us know if this is a good idea. Um, and um, one thing to consider is, do we need something better than today for registers? Would the register packing draft be what we need to solve this, or do we need something like this, or maybe we need both drafts? They are a little bit different. It solves slightly different problems. But basically, please read the draft and let us know what you think. Please give comments on the list. Or if you have a comment right now, that's okay too. All right. Thank you. All right. Not too bad, actually. Very good. Thank you for taking the notes. Thank you for coming, and I think we're done. Well done. What's that? Okay, that's great. Okay. Yeah, just, I guess, leave them there, and we'll copy them out. Thank you. There. Thank so, you. Thank you. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in the, in, in the planet work and money work. Yeah, we've uh, been going through it. For a while now, yeah, and uh, yeah. everyone was focused on the unit caps routing for the longest time while we were doing yeah, the real experimental okay, SMS yeah. stuff, and we've had good success yeah. around doing that. So we did reach our own to the multi cap protocol, but then the unit cap protocols got standardized. Uh, so yeah, people moved on. Yeah. The people who were doing other unit interfaces for the other routers and stuff. And people were interested in the multi cap problem. Yeah. I really think there's good work to be done there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.